the ancient county of Argyll is penetrated by the longest sea loch on the west coast of Scotland. This gigantic arm of the sea stretches for over 70 kilometres from the Sound of Bute, and it's almost double that from the head of the loch to the open sea. Loch Fyne really is the big daddy of them all. On this loch hopping grand tour, I'm travelling across Scotland, exploring the dramatic sea lochs of the west coast, crossing the great freshwater lochs of the central highlands, and discovering the secretive lochs that hide in dark mountain corries. In this programme, my grand tour takes me close to home, to Argyll, and the lochs and stories links to Loch Fyne. Slancha. Along the way, I'll learn how our early ancestors took to the water. That's you stable. Am I? How Victorians dabbled in virtual reality. Hey, that is amazing. And ring in the changes. Ding dong, as they say. It's going to be a fine journey through some of the most historic and magnificent country on the West Coast. Loch Fyne is too big to do in a single grand tour. So I'm starting this northern leg at Loch Glashen in the hills above Loch Gair, before zigzagging my way from shore to shore, north to Strachur, and finally on to Inverary. Loch Glashen is surrounded by conifer plantations. It was dammed in the 1960s to produce hydroelectricity. During construction, the loch was partially drained, revealing a hidden past. The loch has since been flooded again, but when the waters were lowered for the first time, archaeologists discovered a cranog. Now that's an artificial island in the loch, and it had been occupied for centuries, right up to the early medieval period. The mud in the loch had preserved a fascinating range of objects, from wooden bowls to bronze brooches. Remarkably, there were even some items made from leather, including a bag. Down on the shore, leather worker Hamish Lammy is reviving this ancient craft. So what are you going to make? So I'm going to be making what I call a cranic bag. Mm -hmm. So it's a bag based on the one that was found at the cranic here. Well, that must be quite unusual for, for leather to be preserved for that length of time, because you're, you're talking centuries. When it comes to Scotland, it's quite rare. Yeah, we, we, we have so little finds from that time period. That's why this is such a gem. And it was instantly recognisable as a bag, was it? Sadly not. No. Archaeologists thought it might have been a tunic. A tunic? <laughs> they kind of mocked her up on a body and realised that doesn't look right. And then they put it together as a bag. The satchel was made out of a single skin, much larger than the one Hamish is using today, which suggests that there were deer of considerable size living here 1,400 years ago. We have deer skin here, and I've started cutting the main body out already, and I'm going to do some cutting on the side parts. So we're using the same tools that were around, same techniques, putting it together in, in how we think it was constructed from materials that are as close as we can get as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to hammer in these holes for the laser. What do you learn from doing this? Nothing is wasted, especially in this bag, that it's not sewn together with sinew, but laced together with hide cut from the same hide. Oh. So every single piece is used. So you're now stitching. You're stitching these two pieces of leather together. So yeah, this is how the bag was laced together. And when it's pulled, tight like this, mm -hmm. it creates a perfect seam and it's very strong. It's nice to see it come alive as you work with it. So this is the bag that's almost finished? Yes, so the braid that I'm going to add to this is uh, a little clasp that I like to add uh -huh. because the original didn't have anything on it. Did it not? So it could have been unfinished. Maybe it just didn't need a clasp on it. Uh -huh. We don't know. That's how I've come up with to keep it secure and we have our finished cranic bag. It's absolutely superb. Thank you. The original bag was probably used to carry everyday objects, 
But it wasn't the only leather item used to transport 7th century goods. They also had whole boats made of leather. This is what we call a coracle or a kura. So this it is, is a coracle. It is essentially a basket covered in cowhide. Right. Yeah. That's exactly what it looks like. And these were used all throughout Scottish history. The Romans mentioned the, the Scots and the Picts raiding south from coracles. So they were used even then. Yeah, but bigger ones than this, surely, because you're not telling me that these are seaworthy in any way. They absolutely are, and we're going to have a go. You're kidding. <laughs> yeah, <too. laughs> right. Do you want me to give you a hand? Yeah, if we get it in here, I'm going to stabilise this. Right, so I'm going to sit and get one leg in. Stepping aboard, Hamish hands me a single paddle and pushes me off. That's you stable. Am I? And now I'll get in. <laughs> Apparently, the technique is to draw a figure of eight in front of you, but I seem to be stuck in reverse gear. We're going back in time. Well, I'm going backwards. <laughs> back in time. I'm actually maintaining a steady position into the wind without moving anywhere. So I count that as a triumph. Leaving Hamish adrift, I head downhill, past tranquil Loch Gair, and onto the shores of Loch Fyne, where the coast is studded with once grand houses and magnificent castles. Across on the eastern shore is one of the oldest, Castle Lachlan. There's been a castle here since the early 14th century, when it was the principal seat of Clan Lachlan. Old Castle Lachlan became a ruin in the 18th century after the clan chief, who was an ardent Jacobite supporter, lost his life at the Battle of Culloden in 1746. Now, legend has it that his riderless horse made it all the way back home, signalling to the rest of the clan that their chief was dead. The castle was bombarded and then deserted. But in the Victorian era, the romantic ruin attracted the attention of Scotland's photographic pioneers, led by George Washington Wilson. George originally trained as a portrait artist, but made a name for himself as a photographer and won the patronage of the royal family. His business flourished, and he was able to indulge his passion capturing the Scottish scenery with his camera, including this dual image of Castle Lachlan. When George Washington Wilson came to Lachlan Castle, he didn't just want to record the scene that he found here, he wanted to bring it alive in a brand new way. And to do that, he used a groundbreaking piece of photographic equipment, the stereoscopic camera. To discover how this novel form of photography worked, I've come to the very spot where George Washington Wilson took his stereoscopic photo. Photographer Alex Boyd reveals the intention behind this double image. We're here in front of Castle Lachlan. I've got my digital camera, pretty modern. You've also got quite a modern camera, but its, it's heritage is more of the Victorian ilk. Yes, that's right. Just one vital difference, it has one lens instead of two. Right. Yes. That's a crucial difference because I would have thought to take a stereoscopic image, you would need two lenses. That's right. They had two lenses, uh, which uh -huh. were just a couple of inches apart, uh -huh. just the way that our eyes are slightly apart. And when these were viewed uh, through a stereoscopic viewer, it kind of gave the illusion of depth. To bring the two photos together, a handheld viewer helps to focus the eyes. What do you do, just look through the... That's right, yeah. Now that is amazing, look at that. It's leaping out at me in glorious 3D. Now that is astonishing. Using the same process, where plates are coated with light-sensitive chemicals, Alex has taken some of his own photographs of the Scottish landscape. So can I have a, a wee yeah, look? Yeah, sure, go for it. So, yeah. This is wonderful. That's on metal, is it? Yeah, it's a uh, tin type. Um, and this is an image um, of the old man of Storr on Skye, which is somewhere that George Washington Wilson would have known very well indeed. It's got a, a really interesting kind of handmade feel to it. 
Yeah, you can see my thumbprint in the corner there, you know. Oh, yes, I've yeah. held it as I yeah. poured the chemicals onto it. Yeah, yeah. And this one is on glass and that's right, that's I can't it. quite make it out. Oh, wait a minute. When the light hits it at an angle, it suddenly becomes a positive because that's the negative and that's the positive. That's amazing. To create a print from the plate, Alex will invert the shading using prepared paper and sunlight. Luckily, I've brought some more advanced technology with me. So I think it's time that we took our own photograph now. I think you're right, yes. Right. Yeah. Well, you, uh, you disappear under your okay, hood. OK, I will do. <laughs> now, see if I can switch my camera on. Oh, dear. Have got the lens cap off? Yes, got the lens cap off. Ah, press this button. I have an image. Do you have an image yet? Yes, it's wonderful. It's upside down, but... It's a it's, disadvantage, uh... I would have thought. Mine's pretty good, actually. Well, I won't know until I go home. <laughs> <laughs> so. It's still a grand view, though, isn't it? Yes, I don't think it's changed very much. Just the tide's gone up and down, and that's uh -huh. it, really. Yeah, yeah. Pulling my focus back to the course of my journey, I return to the western shore of Loch Fyne and head up to the old farming community of Achendrian. Achendrian is a highland survivor, a township from the past that offers a unique insight into the daily lives of people who lived in this part of Argyll a century or more ago. It was a hard life and the last residents left here in 1967. But the buildings and farmland are preserved as an open-air museum. Showing me around is Bob Clark, the director of the site. Bob, as I understand it, Achandrian's quite unique. You know, why is that? Well, we're the last township, the sole survivor. There were thousands of places like this, and all the rest of them got uh, cleared, improved out of existence, uh, but we survived. Now, why was that? Well, this strip of land was isolated from uh, the rest of the Duke of Argyle's land. It wasn't worth combining with anyone else to make a bigger farm. It wasn't worth the investment to improve it. So they literally just left it alone at the end of the 18th century and in the 19th century. But by the middle of the 19th century, Achandrian and its residents had become something of a curiosity for the Duke, who began showing it off to his aristocratic guests. He actually brings us our first tourist, the evening of the 25th of September, 1875, and it's Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria came here? She did indeed. Really? And she's brought here to see <laughs> the primitive villages, as she says in her diaries. Right. So this is early poverty tourism, is it? Absolutely. And the common folk would have lived in a house a bit like this, I'm guessing. Well, the better sort of the people here, the tenants, lived in long houses like these. The dwelling at one end, and we're just standing outside the door to the buyer, um, which is next to the kitchen. And I've got to ask you, Paul, how many cows do you keep in the room next to your kitchen? Not many. In fact, I can't think of a single one. Well, that's what they did. In, in winter, every cow is worth two kil kilowatts. It's like an electric fire. Well, just in terms of the, the heat that it's giving Radiating off. the heat. Wow. And the buyer is also the conveniences for the house. So these are the facilities. These this are is the ensuite facilities. The ensuite facilities, the en -suite with, facilities the en -suite with heater. in the long house. Oh, and at the end of winter, everything all gets shoveled out and goes on the land as manure. So that's proper recycling. Absolutely recycling. They recycled just about everything they could here. They were too poor not to. Despite living right on the breadline, there was one room in the house reserved for finery. Simply called the room, perhaps this is where the Queen stopped for tea. Almost like Balmoral. Keeping the museum up to royal standards is no small task, with 15 buildings and 22 acres of land to maintain in an authentic way. Museum worker Cathy has roped me in to lend a hand. I'm kind of slightly frightened I'm going to demolish no, the entire wall. No, you won't. It'll come out. <laughs> Today's task is to replace the modern cement mortar on one of the gable ends. So why are we going to be doing this? What's the point? Because it's not meant to be in there in the first place, cement. It's meant to be lime mortar. Unlike breathable lime mortar, 
When it rains, which it does a lot in Argyll, the cement traps the moisture and can cause damp issues inside the house. That's you, clear. So what do you reckon, Cathy? Do you think it's time to do some pointing? Yes. That's okay. enough to get pointing done. Right. You just scoop some up like scoop so. Scoop up, uh-huh. Now you just put it all the way back into the cavity and keep filling. Right, just keep filling. Yeah. Right, there we are. That's that. Be a bit done. And it looks good. Yeah. <laughs> one line, one stone. You've got a lot more to do, Cathy. Yes. I wish you well. Leaving Achendrian's restoration in more capable hands, I motor across the loch to my next destination, the village of Strachar on the eastern shore. Making the crossing, I'm reminded of a legend about a man who rejoiced in the happy name of McFun. According to the popular version of the tale, Archie McFun fell on hard times and became a sheep stealer. Now, he was eventually caught, imprisoned, tried, and then hanged for his crimes at Inverary Jail behind me. It then fell to his distraught wife to ferry the corpse back to their home in Strachur. And she was halfway across the loch when she noticed that Archie was not quite dead. Thinking very quickly, she grabbed a nearby bottle of whiskey, mixed it with her own breast milk, and gave it to her stricken husband. And miraculously, Archie came back to life. Under old Scots law, a criminal couldn't be hanged twice for the same offence. But it seems that Archie didn't trust the authorities to honour the spirit of the law and went into hiding in a cave near Strachar. Wherever there's a good story, commerce is sure to follow. And the case in point is this whisky, which for a while was marketed using the McFun legend. But beware. It's cast strength, single malt, and requires a wee drop of burn water to, shall we say, loosen the noose and free the spirit. Slancha. Feeling almost as revived as half-hung Archie, I leave the village and make my way uphill on the trail of a more recent legend. When I was about 13, I spent most weekends tramping the hills close to home with my pal Gus. One soggy day in early spring, we were exploring high above Strachar when we came across the wreckage of an American World War II bomber. There were bits and pieces of the aircraft scattered everywhere. And I've even got a photograph of Gus sitting on what turned out to be the tail gun turret of a B-29 flying superfortress. Years later, I was amazed to come across newspaper articles that claimed the plane was carrying diamonds smuggled out of Europe. And then there are stories of high-denomination banknotes blowing around the crash site and of an extra previously unaccounted for body on the scene. Conspiracy theorists had a field day. I'm heading back to the crash site with Ross Galt, who helped build the memorial cairn to the 20 men who lost their lives here in 1949. Oh, wow, yeah. That's a huge area covered by wreckage. It was very different from when I was last here. There were no trees. So this is the site of the B-29 Super Fortress. That's correct. The remains of one of two aircraft that took off um, from Lincolnshire, England. Uh -huh. And it was heading home to Kansas in America. And unfortunately, this is... Um, well, it never made it. It never made it. Do we know what happened? The captain of the aircraft believed he was out over the water. Uh -huh. So he thought he had a safe... Uh, descent, oh, come in safely. Uh, to basically to lose height and come out of what's known as icing conditions. Now, what do you make of the conspiracy theories that have grown up around this crash site? 
think it's like a lot of things in life. There's elements of truth. Um, the captain of the aircraft was a trained jeweler. When he was leaving the force, he was going to set up his own business, his own jewellery business. And what about the stories of high denomination banknotes floating about? The aircraft came to a violent end that burned for 24 hours, approximately. Papers, things like that. I'd have mm -hmm. imagined that most of that, if not mm -hmm. all of that, burned. Given the intense heat, it's surprising that parts of the plane, such as the tail gun turret and cylinder heads, are still recognisable. Even some personal effects have survived. There's been two separate occasions where personal objects have been found within the wreckage. Is it's, that it? This is the ring here. It looks more like bling than a ring. <laughs> so that belongs to one of the crew members on board, um, Paul Knight. Um, when the cairn was being built, a couple of small bits of wreckage were moved. It was actually my brother uh, that found this. What's that? And this is a dog tag. It's a name tag? For Anthony Christus. So these two items uh, are very close to going back to America uh, for the extensive really? research and tracking down. Finally, these objects will make their way to, 70 to America. Year, 70 years too late, uh -huh. but uh, they are getting home eventually. I'm glad these personal items will finally complete their journey across the Atlantic. It will make a symbolic homecoming for the American airman who died on a Scottish hillside all those years ago. Continuing north up Loch Fyne, I'm getting close to the head of the loch. My next destination lies at an old crossroads where 26 white quartz stones form a mysterious heart-shaped symbol. Jess Smith comes from a traveling background and reveals their meaning. This is significant to the traveling people. And in this era, at one time, we were called the Tinkers or, or the Cairds. The Church of the Land never accepted them at, at any time. So this had a significant sacred uh, place to them. Uh -huh. And it's where they married, it's where the children were brought to be blessed, and it's where the dead were brought. So what is it about this place that is so special to travelling folk, to Tinker folk? So nobody knows what the connection this place has to the Tinkers, but the area is very, very sacred to them. And right here in the crossroads, because when you look at the culture of the Tinkers, uh -huh. crossroads are, are quite important to them. In the 1960s, the old crossroads were bypassed and the Tinker's heart was almost forgotten. When Jess learned of its fate, she decided to act. We, we almost lost it, um, but I had a word with a lady in the Noon area who actually told me it was in a bit of a mess and for my sins I've forgotten. You know, as I played here as the wee lassie, it's my mother's place. So I came up to see it and I decided to start a campaign and people came on board to help me and the Scottish government, you know, after six years of, of um, inviting them uh -huh. to give it a, a special protection, they actually did list it. Really? So this is a, a, a listed this site is a, now? Listed as a it's national, a historic monument. It's a national monument. That's tremendous. Do we know if it's still used by travelling people as a sacred place. There has been weddings, there has been funerals. So it's beginning to, to live again. It's beating again. From the beating Tinker's heart and memories of travelling folk, I'd recross Loch Fine to the last loch on my tour, Loch Shira, where the famously picturesque town of Inverary hugs the shore. One of the first planned towns in Scotland, Inverary's visual charms weren't lost on George Washington Wilson, who photographed it in Victorian times. Now, the views changed really very little, except for the bell tower, which you can see behind me, which isn't on the photograph. Now, it was built about 100 years ago by the Duke of Argyll as a war memorial. The bell tower. To find out more, I'm heading up to the top of the tower to meet Angela Deakin amongst an impressively large set of bells. So there were 10 bells here at uh, Inverary Bell Tower. 
and yes. it's the second heaviest ring of ten in the world. The heaviest is at Wells Cathedral. So it's almost world beating. Almost, yes. <laughs> but not quite. Yes, but... they're, they're very nice sounding, I would say. They're probably the best, some of the best sounding bells in the world. Oh, really? Yes. And what occasions do you ring the bells? Um, we ring them for special occasions. Um, we have specific performances which are called peals. Um, when we do change ringing, the order of the bells changes each time. And for something to be a peal, there have to be 5,000 sets of changes or 5,000 sets of different orders. So it takes quite a long time. 5,000? Yes. So, so how long does that take you? So it usually takes somewhere between <laughs> three and a half hours and three and three quarter hours. Good grief. Now, um, would it be possible for me to ring one of these bells? Uh, yes, we can let you chime one of these bells. Back downstairs is the ringing room where the ropes from the bells hang ready to be rung. Angela, I've got the rope in front of me. What do I do? So if you step up onto the box so you can reach the fluffy bit and then you're just trying to put energy into the bell to swing it slightly. So pull down and let go and it will go up and down. Just let it swing a little bit more each time. OK, so now you've probably got the bell swinging enough. So as you get to the top, just try and check it. That's it. Ah! Brilliant. Brilliant. What's the weight of this bell? A tonne and a half. A tonne and a half and I'm moving it. Oh. That's brilliant. I'm stop it. <laughs> right, so just slowly, just move your hands up each time, just try and take a little bit of energy out. That's it, just gently. Brilliant. It's exhausting. Well, thanks very much. Ding dong, as they say. Suffering from the campanologist condition of slight tinnitus, I make my way back to the loch side. Commanding the view is the Duke of Argyll chateau-like castle, set beneath a steep-sided hill called Dun the Quaich, with its 18th century folly sitting on the top. Dun the Quaich is a place I've seen all my life, but until now, I've never visited. Down the Quaich Walk. Once again, I'm on the trail of George Washington Wilson, who climbed up to the viewpoint to take a photograph here about a hundred years ago. And look at that. Pretty as a picture. Worthy of one, too. The Gaelic name, Dun na Quaich, suggests that a fort once occupied the hilltop. But today, it's guarded by the purely ornamental watchtower, built to enhance the landscape from the castle far below. I can see why George Washington Wilson was attracted here. Now, the view might have changed a wee bit over the last century or so, but it's still an impressive sight and will make a fine photograph for me to end my grand tour from Loch Glashan to Loch Shearer. Look at that. Beautiful. Join me on my next grand tour when I'll be crossing the wilderness from Kinloch Leven in the west to Loch Lagan in the central highlands. And Mark Stevens